Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Greetings from HKIC Shanghai office. Thank you everyone for joining us today's webinar. Uh, this is Lin Yang uh, from Hong Kong International Arbitration Center Shanghai office. So welcome everybody to join the first session of uh, the Hong Kong IAC Chinese Arbitration Insights webinar series. This is the first webinar series launched by HKIC that specifically targets the men and the Chinese arbitration that is relevant to offshore arbitration institutions. We will be conducting this webinar series in total of four sessions from April to July. So we are so pleased to see that this series has attracted a huge pool of audience across the world. So we have seen more than 900 people from 74 jurisdictions signed up for this webinar series. Thank you and welcome. So this series will be covering key developments relevant to the users of arbitration where there is a mainland Chinese element. HKIC, as some of you know, may, may know that HKIC has a rich experience of mainland China related disputes and HKIC has been handling the highest volume of disputes involving, involving mainland Chinese parties outside of mainland China. Together with access to the latest developments and the perspectives on the ground through our network in mainland China. Uh, some of you may know that HKIC also is the first offshore arbitration institution to set up its Men and China office in 2015. So today, our webinar uh, will okay. be our webinar uh, will be focusing on the foreign related elements and the governing law and the Chinese law. So the concept or the phrase of foreign related elements is unique under Chinese law, and it is the key to understand how foreign arbitration institutions such as HKIC or HK Hong Kong arbitration could involve the mainland Chinese elements. So why do we put this topic as the first session? So there was a story. So several months ago, a South Korean lawyer met with me. The, this South Korean lawyer is a corporate lawyer uh, focusing on South Korea and uh, China business. And uh, this South Korean lawyer has been based in Shanghai for more than 12 years. So he told me that over the past decades, he helped many South Korean companies to invest in mainland China by establishing joint ventures or wholly foreign owned enterprises we called uh, UFIs in mainland China. Of course, he told me that Hong Kong arbitration is the most popular choice or clause in those transactions. So in recent years, he also helps the South Korean companies, affiliated Chinese companies to handle their business. And uh, he asked whether those transactions could submit it to offshore arbitration institution. For example, UFIS. Wufi's transaction with another Wufi in mainland China, or Wufi's transaction with another pure Chinese companies. So he asked whether those kind of transactions could be submitted to uh, offshore arbitration, for example, Hong Kong uh, arbitration. So my answer was quite simple, is that uh, it depends on the foreign related elements in the contract. So then this South mm. Korean lawyer asked another further question. Some, he asked, some office are incorporated in China free trade zones and the counterparties are also Chinese companies. If all the parties of this transaction are uh, in mainland China, is that a non-foreign related or it could be regarded as foreign related contract. So frankly, at that time, it is very difficult or it is not easy to answer that question. So I believe the answer is more than complicated. So because uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, if you have some uh, 
uh, observation on the recent developments in China, especially with the new developments with Chinese free trade zones developments since 2014, the scope of foreign related elements is in the process of changing. So in addition, the foreign related elements also determine the governing law of the contract and other important aspects for those who are doing business or will be doing business in or related to mainland China. So I believe today our guest speakers will explain all the importance and the recent developments of foreign related elements and the Chinese law. So today, we are very fortunate to have uh, two prominent practitioners in the region to join us, Helen Shi and Mei Tai. Helen, Helen is a Chinese lawyer. Yes, yes. he's a can partner. Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, Helen is a, yes, I can hear you, Mei. I can hear you, Helen, yes. Helen is a partner from Fonda Partners in its Beijing office, and she has uh, extensive experience in both Chinese arbitration and the international arbitration, including Hong Kong arbitration. Helen has been acting as a counsel, as an expert, and as an arbitrator in both domestic arbitration and international arbitration. So May, uh, May is a managing partner uh, to the Herbert Smith Freefields Asia offices, and uh, he's a managing partner of the HSW, HSF uh, Asian offices, and now she's based in Hong Kong. So uh, the audience, you can see that, uh, all of three speakers of today are based in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and uh, Hong Kong. So uh, May has been leading the firm's uh, China's practice since 2017 and specialized in the wide range of cross-border China-related uh, and regional Asia disputes. So Helen and May, so I thank you both for uh, agreeing to contribute to this event, and I really look forward to, for the genuinely productive discussion with you later. So before we officially started, I have some housekeeping matters for all the audience. So today's session, we will have two parts. First, uh, we will have a panel discussion with May and uh, Helen for around 40 minutes. And then our today's session will leave around 15 minutes for Q and A. So if you, before the screen, if all the audience, if you, any of you have any questions about today's topic, foreign related, governing law, uh, Chinese arbitration, offshore international arbitration. So please feel free. And so you are encouraged to write down your questions through the Q and A function. In Chinese, it shows that Wen Da Huan Jie. So please write down your questions through the Q and A function. And we, all of us, we are trying to answer your question later of this session. So now we would proceed to our first part, uh, panel discussion. So I have prepared five groups of questions for Helen and May. Are you ready? Yes, good. Yes. So, yes, good. So first question. So what does the foreign related elements mean under Chinese law? What is the significance of the distinction between non-foreign related elements and the foreign related elements and uh, Chinese law. Helen, so why and how does it, it matter to the men and the parties? So, thank you. Thank you, Yangling. Uh, before elaborating upon the significance of foreign related elements, I hear a big echo here. I'm not sure whether you can hear me clearly, Yangling. Okay, good. Uh, before we discuss this foreign related elements concept under the Chinese law, I would like to clarify first that the word foreign here should include Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan in this specific context. This has been clarified and reflected in many of the Chinese Supreme People's Court judicial interpretations. For example, in one of the cases in which SPC issued its directions to a lower court, the SPC's view is that cases involving parties from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, 
also their, uh, uh, although their nationality is China, those cases should be deemed to have involved foreign elements and it should be handled as foreign related case. Foreign related elements is a legal concept under Chinese international private law, known as conflict of laws in common law jurisdictions. It is important because Chinese law regulates civil and commercial relations uh, processing foreign elements differently from those without such elements. For example, the parties in an international sale of goods contract are permitted to choose foreign law as their governing law of the contract. And uh, are also allowed to choose foreign arbitration institution to resolve their future disputes. And also foreign court, if there is a connection with that foreign jurisdiction. However, for pure domestic disputes, it would be extremely risky if the parties choose a foreign law as the governing law or choose a foreign arbitration institution or foreign court to resolve their future disputes. Um, in terms of the Chinese law governing uh, the uh, arbitration, as you, you may aware, Chinese law adopts two track system. The, the law regulates foreign related arbitration uh, and the domestic arbitration differently. As shown at the bottom part of the PPT, this affects the procedures and also the scope of the PRC law when PRC courts are involved in reviewing and enforcing the arbitration award. Uh, for domestic arbitration award, such award, the lower court will not report their decision to the higher, uh, to the Supreme People's Court. Uh, and also uh, uh, the evidence issue for the firm related arbitration case, uh, the court will not review, will not reopen the case or review any substantive issues of the dispute. Will only review, the court will only review the procedure uh, issues of the case involved. So the Chinese party need to be a, need to be aware of uh, the existence of foreign elements because they might be requested uh, by uh, their uh, counterparty in a negotiation of a contract uh, requested by that by the uh, uh, counterparty to choose foreign law or foreign forum for disputes. Yes, Yang Ling, this is my interpretation and my uh, view. You. Thank yeah, you. thank you. So very clear. So for our international audience from the Highlands uh, illustration about the Chinese law, about the importance of a foreign related and the Chinese law, you may see that. So at least for, uh, for our offshore arbitration institutions, so uh, from the standpoint of a PRC law, so only those foreign related contract, the parties can submit those kind of contract to uh, offshore arbitration institutions and to choose non-PRC law as a governing law. Even for those pure domestic arbitration, foreign related uh, elements, uh, it's also quite important because it's to determine the scope of the judicial review on those arbitral award and the arbitration agreement. So uh, May, I have the same question for you. So uh, why and how does the foreign related elements matter for international parties? And uh, especially for those who already have a business with men and China, Chinese party or who want to do in business uh, within Chinese parties. Thanks, Yang Ling. It's, it's also very important for international parties with some sort of business presence in China or significant business interests in China to be familiar with these rules, these quite technical rules. Um, just to distinguish between the different transactions and business that you can have in China. So what I'm talking about is not 
let's say you, you have a sale and purchase agreement with a Chinese counterparty, you're buying goods from China, that's not the types of contracts that you should be too concerned about. What you should be concerned about is where you have um, as a foreign party, you have a local subsidiary in China that is conducting your Chinese business with Chinese counterparties, then I think it is more relevant or very relevant to you to understand these restrictions, which Helen's going to uh, elaborate on in a moment, and understand your ability to choose between governing law and between dispute resolution mechanisms, because it's my experience that not all international non-Chinese parties are necessarily familiar with um, jurisdictions which do not give parties complete free reign on choosing their DR mechanism and choosing their governing law, especially for commercial contracts and commercial disputes. I think in a lot of jurisdictions, you take for granted that party autonomy when it comes to arbitration is key and that you know, countries will allow parties a broad jurisdiction, so a broad discretion to choose what type of arbitration they want for their disputes, but that is not always the case. Um, so when in the PRC, you're talking even about purely commercial contracts, depending on whether there are foreign elements or not. And again, Helen will get into the details of the rules in a moment. Even with purely commercial contracts like SPAs, sale and purchase agreements, joint venture agreements, services agreements, you still have to be familiar with the rules. And finally, and I guess this is the reason why it's very important to be familiar with the rules and very relevant if you choose the wrong option, um, the consequences are very serious and they can be twofold. First, your arbitration agreement could be declared invalid um, by either the tribunal or the PRC court, and therefore you've lost the DR mechanism that you and your counterparties have agreed on, and then you have to resort to a sort of default mechanism that would normally apply when there is no um, jurisdiction clause, no dispute resolution agreement, which is, you know, in the typical case to sue your counterparty in their home court, in their home territory. So that's one important consequence, which is not very good. The second consequence, um, and we will come to a bit to this again later on in the discussion, is that the even if you manage to get an arbitral award applying your arbitration agreement, if such an arbitration agreement is, is one that would be declared invalid by the PRC court, then your, the award that is rendered is also potentially unenforceable when you come to seek enforcement against a PRC counterparty in the PRC courts. So in a way that's almost worse than having your clause declared invalid from the start because you spent all this time and money to get there, to get an award award, the successful award, hopefully, and then you really have no way to enforce it. So, so those are the two key bad consequences that you want to avoid by understanding these rules very, very thoroughly. Thank you, May. Thank you, Helen. So I think most of the audience, all the audience has understand how important to understand the foreign related elements and the PRC law. So it's quite important for both uh, P, uh, PRC parties and the foreign parties when dealing with international transactions. Okay, second question. I, I believe this is the most important question for today's webinar, is that uh, uh, what is the criteria of the foreign related element and the Chinese law? So this is uh, the question I want to ask Helen first, and then I will ask May the uh, similar aspect about the same question. Okay, Helen, please. Ah, yeah, yeah. As I introduced earlier, uh, foreign related elements is a legal concept under the Chinese conflict law rules. In China, such conflict law rules are contained in the applicable law for foreign related civil relations. Uh, the previous page, uh, Professor Yang. Uh, 
uh, the applicable law for foreign related civil relations. Uh, this rule apply when there are conflicts among the domestic law of different countries involved in relation to a, pri a private transaction uh, or dispute. According to Article 8 of this law, uh, the previous page, Yangling. Yeah, according to Article 8 of this law, the law of forum, lex forum, shall apply to the determination of the nature of foreign related civil relations. So if the case is before a Chinese court, the court will for the first step to rely on this clause uh, and uh, apply PRC law to determine whether there is a foreign relate, whether this is a foreign related matter or whether the foreign elements are actually involved. Uh, next page. Yang Ming, please. Thank you. Uh, let's see how the Spring People's Court interpret uh, uh, the criteria of foreign elements. So the Chinese court clarified certain typical foreign related elements through uh, SPC's interpretation of this law and also in SPC's interpretation on PRC civil procedure law. According to those judicial interpretations, the typical foreign related elements include the following five situations as listed in this page of uh, in this slide of PPT. First, uh, the nationality of the parties. If uh, the party to a, uh, to a dispute, uh, yeah, let, let's uh, mention the dispute, uh, foreign related disputes or foreign related case. Uh, at the list one of the party to the dispute is the foreign citizen foreign legal entity or other organization or individual without nationality. That's the first uh, situation. Uh, the second one is also concerning the party. Uh, the habitual residence of one or both parties is outside the PRC. The third one is the subject matter of the dispute is located outside the P PRC. Uh, for example, the construction uh, project uh, outside mainland China. Uh, the fourth point is the legal facts establishing, changing or terminating the party's civil relationship occurred all, outside the PRC. Uh, for example, the parties uh, negotiated, revised the agreement uh, in another jurisdiction. Uh, the final one is other circumstances that may be considered as foreign related civil relations. Uh, and I believe this, uh, for this uh, final one, the PRC court has the power and authority to determine other circumstances. Now I would like to introduce two leading cases. Uh, yes, thank you, Yang. Um, in uh, two leading cases uh, that Spring People's Court had opined on both cases. Uh, in one case, the Chinese court this is 2013 Chao Lai Xinxiang's case. The Chinese court refused to enforce a foreign arbitration award uh, due to the dispute lacking foreign elements. But in another case, in 2015 Golden Landmark case, uh, the Chinese court supported the enforcement of foreign arbitral award. Uh, let's see why the Chinese court had different rulings. In this Chalai Xinxian case, uh, the parties are the following two. One Chinese company and another one is wholly foreign-owned company. 
uh, invested by a foreign company, but registered in Beijing in China. So uh, for all this uh, reference, a foreign invested company, a Wufi, registered in China, even it was 100% held by foreign investors, as long as it is not registered in a free trade zone, it will be deemed as a Chinese entity, not a foreign entity. So in this case, uh, the PRC court believe the disputes are actually between two domestic companies. The subject matter of this case is, uh, 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 is to operate a, a golf course in Beijing and the contract was signed in Beijing. So after the introduction of those uh, facts, you, you, you may reach your own conclusion that there were no foreign elements involved in this case. Uh, but the parties choose KCAB, which is uh, Korean Commercial Arbitration Board, uh, to resolve their uh, uh, disputes through arbitration. So when the winning party tried to enforce this award before Beijing Intermediate People's Court. Uh, the court reported this case up to the Supreme People's Court. Uh, and it was uh, their view, the court's view, that the case should not be enforced because there was no foreign elements uh, and the Chinese party supposed to resolve their disputes uh, in China. Uh, in this uh, golden landmark case, uh, both parties uh, were actually uh, wholly foreign investment company companies registered in free trade zone in Shanghai. And the contract performed in Shanghai. Arbitration before Singapore International Arbitration Center. It seems quite similar with the previous case I just introduced because the parties are too goofy registered in China. The only difference is those goofies were registered in free trade zone. Uh, so the PRC court supported the enforcement of this uh, SIAC arbitration award. The reason given by the Chinese court was that the connection with free trade zone can be deemed as foreign elements. This falls within the fifth category, as I just mentioned in the uh, previous PPT, when I introduced the previous PPT, the fifth circumstance where the court can identify other foreign elements. So uh, Yang Ling, this is my introduction of uh, uh, a PRC legislation on foreign elements and the two leading cases. Okay, thank you, Helen. It's quite clear that uh, uh, because according to the Chinese law regis uh, re uh, legislation, uh, the, the scope of a foreign related elements is uh, was quite clear of five criteria, but the last one is a more tricky, the other circumstances. So Helen just mentioned the two leading cases uh, where the SPC explains what is other circumstances the PRC court should take into consideration. So well, uh, based on this uh, question, I have a, uh, another question for May. So uh, because in the Chao Lai Xinsen case, the KCAB tribunal made it a word, uh, issued a word, and uh, the I I, be, I don't know uh, I don't know the details about the facts, but I believe one of the parties should have raised the same question before the KCB tribunal. So my question for you: So as an international practitioner or international arbitrator, so any criteria about the foreign related elements uh, under Hong Kong law or how the international tribunal uh, will apply the similar PRC criteria to determine uh, the, the, the foreign related elements or 
Yeah. May? Um, to answer your first question, there, there, there is no similar criteria under Hong Kong law. And what I mean by that is you can choose to arbitrate your disputes anywhere using whatever institutes, regardless of whether they have foreign elements or not. So the foreign elements concept doesn't exist under Hong Kong law. It's uh, Hong Kong law adopts in the, is an UNCITRAL model law country. It's very arbitration friendly. And as I mentioned earlier, the expectation about party autonomy, that is very much key in, in Hong Kong. But having said that, for people who are maybe more new to arbitration, it doesn't mean that every single dispute can be arbitrated. There will still be restrictions that apply in Hong Kong, for example, depending on the subject matter of the dispute. If it's competition, disputes, or you know, some environmental regulations or some employment regulations, a lot of countries will not let you arbitrate that kind of dispute. They will require you to go to court or they will require some sort of local tribunal to deal with the disputes. But this is much more, I think, on arbitrability uh, subjects rather than on this foreign related aspect, which is very unique to China. That said, though, I, I would just also flag that it's not just China that has similar types of restrictions on not allowing for an arbitration over certain classes of disputes. Um, I'm familiar with at least two jurisdictions, two big Asia Pacific jurisdictions that have um, some form of restriction. So Indonesia is one where if you are arbitrating against the state or state entity, I think you have to arbitrate in Indonesia and Vietnam like is also very broad in its restriction, basically to have an enforceable arbitral award, or any arbitration award to be enforceable, um, the arbitration has to be seated in Vietnam and the award rendered in Vietnam. So it's not just the PRC that has a category, a class of restrictions like that. So that's on your first question. On your second question, um, the doctrine of competence, competence of applies um, generally in Hong Kong as in many, many jurisdictions. And what that means is that arbitral tribunals can decide, make a decision on their own jurisdiction. And so, as you mentioned, if one party challenges the validity of the arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction on the basis that the dispute that is being submitted is China related and does not fall into one of the foreign related elements criteria that Helen just helpfully um, listed out earlier, then the tribunal has to decide on the objection and decide whether it has jurisdiction to hear the dispute. In my experience, and I, you know, tribunals are, are, can be very different, but in my experience, tribunals do tend to look at this issue and tend to look at the same test that Helen has mentioned and seek to apply the same criteria. Um, particularly if you have one or more arbitrator who is from the mainland and therefore very familiar with the criteria and very likely um, to apply it properly. Um, but if you do have a tribunal that's not so familiar with PRC arbitration law, then it is possible that the issue will just slip them by if you know, one or both parties don't end up bringing up the issue. Um, and, and I just flag a third possibility, maybe this is a, a bit controversial, but it is possible that tribunals tend to be um, the sort of um, bodies that will try and bend over backwards and find that an arbitration clause is valid where there are gray areas. This is, this is not out of the question, so they may be more generous to find valid arbitration clauses than compared to, to the PRC courts. But maybe that's more something um, for, for Helen and you to link to comment on. Helen. Yes. So do we have any comments on, on May's the third uh, scenario? Uh, you mean how the, uh, 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 the Chinese uh, ar uh, arbitrator will a rule on the foreign elements or the PRC court? 
Yeah, whether you think that the PRC courts will be more strict and, and arbitral tribunals because they are, are keen to find that they have jurisdiction will be a bit more relaxed um, about finding that there are foreign elements. Mm. Uh, I, I, surely the Chinese court uh, is more familiar with the Chinese law than international arbitration uh, tribunal. As you said, if there is one member uh, who is qualified uh, in China, they may flag this issue out to the international tribunal. But if there is no uh, uh, Chinese law arbitrator, or the party did not raise those issues, uh, you know, this issue might only come up to the Chinese court during the enforcement stage. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I should give more background about our today's discussion about that. So Hong Kong is a separate jurisdiction in PRC. So which means Hong Kong is a separate jurisdiction and the only jurisdiction who adopt ancestral model law as a, inter, uh, as a Hong Kong arbitration ordinance. So all we talk about today is about the differences between mainland China's approach and uh, Hong Kong and other jurisdictions. So you, uh, the audience, you may hear from Helen and May that the, the criteria for the foreign related elements uh, why the PRC court and the international tribunal or, or other uh, foreign court may uh, take a different approach on this uh, specific phrase or conception that is understandable because we are in different jurisdictions. This is a general background for all of us. So uh, let's move to the third question or the third group of questions. Uh, so or now we are talking about the importance of foreign related elements, and then we are introducing the criteria of foreign related elements in different jurisdiction. And now uh, I, I would ask Helen that, uh, because you just mentioned at, uh, very earlier that uh, foreign related elements determine the applicable laws of the contract and the arbitration agreement. So let's take an arbitration agreement as an example. So how men and the court determine the applicable law of arbitration agreement and the Chinese law? Uh, okay, this is a very good question. Although I'm not a judge, uh, I'm a, a RB, arbitration practitioner and also handles uh, court disputes as counsel, but evaluating the validity of an arbitration clause or dispute resolution clause is one of the, is the first step that an arbitration lawyer will approach to a commercial dispute or contractual dispute if your client would like to initiate the arbitration proceeding. Again, in my view, the Chinese court will first determine whether there is foreign related, there are foreign related elements in the transaction or involved in this uh, uh, contract. Uh, assuming uh, assuming that the, 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 there is foreign elements and this is foreign related case, uh, the main, mainland court would run a three-step approach to determine the applicable law of an arbitration agreement. The first step, the court will firstly detect whether there is an express choice of law governing the arbitration agreement. If there is such uh, a, a regulation or choice of law made by the parties, the PRC court will respect such choice of law. The second step, if there is no express choice of law on arbitration agreement specifically, the court will apply the law of seat or the law of the place where the arbitration institution is located. If applying the law of those two places leads to a different result, the Chinese court will adopt the validation principle and will apply whichever law leads to confirming the validity of the 
uh, arbitration agreement. This is called validation principle. The step three is that if there was no choice or no clear choice of the applicable law of the arbitration agreement, no clear choice of seat or arbitration institution, the PRC court may apply PRC law as the applicable law to decide the validity of the arbitration agreement. Yeah, okay. So okay. The steps the court okay. will follow. So, yes, very clear. So I have a question related to the foreign related elements. So uh, where the Benin court announced an arbitration agreement invalid, where a non foreign related element contract agreed to submit to an offshore arbitration institution? Uh, yes, the court will, the mainland court will uh, rule that such arbitration agreement is not a valid agreement. As we have really introduced in Chaolai Xinxian's case. Okay, so, uh, so no foreign elements, the parties, subject matter, uh, apart from the foreign arbitration institution, there was no foreign element. So the PRC court uh, ruled that the arbitration agreement was not valid, so they would not support for the enforcement of that case, uh, that rule. Okay, that's quite a serious. So if the two parties choose a Hong Kong law or other unsuitable model law uh, jurisdiction as the governing law of the arbitration agreement, so any different decisions will be made by men and the courts? For example, the Chao Lai Xinxin case, if the two parties choose Hong Kong law as the governing law of the arbitration agreement, there are any different decisions from the PRC court? Well, if the case is before the PRC court, for example, in the enforcement stage, uh, in terms of the arbitration award, I think even if the party choose Hong Kong law as the applicable law for governing the arbitration agreement, uh, the answer is still the same. There would be no differences. Um, the choice of Hong Kong law for arbitration agreement where the dispute has no foreign related elements is also invalid under the PRC law, as I explained before. Only uh, parties in a foreign related relation can choose uh, foreign law to govern their agreement. Arbitration agreement is a separate agreement, but you know they only can choose foreign law, uh, foreign law when there was for foreign elements. Okay, uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, May I have the similar que related question for you that uh, how the international tribunal determine the applicable law of the arbitration agreement? So does the international tribunal have the jurisdiction over the dispute with a non-foreign related elements contract? So? Um, it's a question with no quick answer, I'm afraid. And it's because you, international tribunal in this context covers basically every jurisdiction outside of mainland China. So I'll try and, and give a relatively simple answer. Um, so it's a little bit like China in the sense that if the arbitration agreement does not provide expressly for a governing law of the arbitration agreement, um, which I note very helpfully that the HKIAC model arbitration clause does recommend that you include that. Then, then I guess, then, you know, then it's clear, clear cut. If there is an express choice, the tribunal will normally apply that. So in that sense, it's different from what Helen has just said, where if it's non-foreign related in the mainland and you choose some other law, that could be unenforceable. So in other jurisdictions, and I'm talking very, very generally and basing my answers on, on, on jurisdictions like Hong Kong and Singapore, the tribunal will normally honor that. But unfortunately, most of the times arbitration agreements don't provide expressly for what is the governing law and that can present then uh, uh, uncertainty. The obvious choices are between the governing law of the entire contract, which parties normally specify, or the law of the seat of the arbitration, assuming it's different from the law governing the contract. And again, parties are normally quite good at providing for a seat of arbitration. Um, and 
and how to decide between those two. So there's a lot of case law on this. The most famous one that people quote all the time is probably a, a case called Soul America, where it sets down a three three step test: um, the express choice, if there is one; if not, the implied choice. Um, and if not that, um, then step three is um, the system of law, which um, the arbitration agreement has the closest and most real connection, which if you ask me, is quite difficult normally to work out clearly which law has the closest connection when you have law A, which is the contract law, and law B, which is the seats of arbitration. My experience is that in practice, I think tribunals will usually go for, again, something like the validation principle, which means that they will pick the law which gives effect to the party's agreement to arbitrate. So if there are two options, one of them will mean that the arbitration agreement is invalid. The other one will uphold the party's agreement to arbitrate and let it continue. Then my experience is that tribunals will choose the second one. Having said that, um, sorry, I'm always ending in a, in a less optim optimistic note, is that even if your tribunal chooses the second valid option, there are still problems because number one, you've gone through the time and cost of argue, arguing over which is the applicable law in the arbitration agreement. And secondly, there's the sort of always very important question of whether the arbitration award, once you get it, will survive enforcement especially if you need to enforce in a jurisdiction like mainland China, which you know, doesn't recognize certain types of arbitration agreements, as Helen um, has mentioned earlier. Um, so bottom line is always specify um, the arbitration, the, the, the governing law of the arbitration agreement. If you can, you know, the route chosen by HKIAC, it's much, much better. At least you will avoid the first problem, which is the time and costs of arguing over what is the applicable law. Yeah, thank you, May, to mention the HKIC's model clause on the, we amended our model clause in the year of 2013 to add the uh, choice of law or governing law of the arbitration agreement. So it's quite clear. So it's kind of a direction for uh, all the parties to, to make your, how to make your arbitration agreement valid and a specific uh, choice of law under this model clause. So thank you so much. So let's move to the, the fourth question. So, so uh, 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 based on the discussion from the question number one to question number three, I believe all the audience have heard that the different approach uh, taken by PRC court and uh, other international uh, tribunal, tri tribunal seated in uh, other jurisdictions outside of mainland China. So uh, the, the, the next question is that uh, uh, another further question actually, so follow to the uh, number one, number two, and number three is about the, uh, where there are uh, Cao Lai Xinxin, uh, Helen just mentioned the Cao Lai Xinxin case. So uh, Helen just mentioned that the Cao Lai Xinxin case is the first case or first foreign arbitration award refused by uh, PRC court due to the uh, uh, reason of a non-foreign related elements. So Helen, so would you please give us a more details about the Cao Lai Xinxin and then explain mm -hmm. or give more details about the approach uh, taken by the yeah. Mandela court? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cao Lai Xinxin is one of the typical cases that the PRC court refused to enforce because uh, due to the lack of uh, foreign elements, there might be other previous cases uh, ruled uh, on the same ground, same basis. Um, uh, for this Chao Lai Xinxin case, we have already introduced the basic facts of the, the case involved in, in enforcement of the arbitration award, such as the parties, uh, Chinese companies, uh, the su subject matter is in China, the signing place of the contract is in Beijing, uh, and this was before case A and B. The award was issued by Korean a foreign arbitration institution. So the Intermediate People's Court of Beijing reported the case to the higher court of Beijing and then up to the Supreme People's Court. Because only foreign related or foreign arbitration award when PRC court is reviewing the impossibility of such award and if the initial court uh, uh, have the initial view for non-enforcement or that, that they should report it the case 
up to the Supreme People's Court, and only Supreme People's Court has the final say on the enforceability of such a home court rule. Uh, although the conclusion for non-enforcement remain the same, but the reason of the different level of the course, different level of the Chinese court, uh, was to some extent different. So I actually do not agree with the reasoning given by the Supreme People's Court. So I will uh, elaborate a little bit on this. Beijing Intermediate People's Court first identified that the dispute does not contain any foreign elements, foreign related elements, then deter, uh, determined that, that arbitration agreement contained therein is invalid. Therefore, Beijing court refused to recognize and enforce this award based on the following two grounds uh, under the New York Convention uh, for recognizing, recognizing the enforcement of the uh, arbitration award. The first ground uh, is under Article 5. 1A, uh, meaning there was no valid arbitration agreement. Uh, the second ground is Article 5.2B, violation of public policy. So this is the intermediate level uh, people's court's view. Uh, and SPC confirmed the uh, Beijing uh, people's court conclusion, seeing this award should be refused to be enforced. Uh, and also confirm the reasoning for the first ground based on Article 5.1a, no valid arbitration agreement, but to reject it as the basis on public policy ground. And SPC explained that PRC law should be the governing law to decide the validity of this arbitration agreement. Uh, well, in my view, I have no objection for refusing to enforce this arbitration award. But in terms of the grounds uh, for the non-enforcement, I, I think it should be public policy, uh, not Article 5.1a uh, on the validity of the arbitration agreement. Because the issue in this case is whether domestic parties can choose foreign arbitration institution. If not, why? If Chinese party in a domestic, a domestic matter are allowed to choose foreign law and a foreign venue to resolve their disputes, they will bypass the judiciary of China. This was actually the legislative purpose of the con conflict law rules in China. And the violation of this rule, rule is indeed a public policy concern. So the problem of relying Article 5.1a by the Supreme Court's Court is that the law applicable of deciding the validity of the arbitration agreement under Article 5.1a are either the law of the people's choice, uh, the law of the party's choice, or the law of the arbitration seat. Uh, so in this Chaolai Xinxian case, there was no express choice of law of the arbitration agreement, and the seat is in Korea. So directly applying Article 5.1a, the governing law for the arbitration agreement is Korean law, should not be the Chinese law. So there is no room to apply PRC law to determine the validity of the arbitration agreement if Article 5.1a was the basis. Um, there is another point in the SPC reasoning that I want, I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the PRC added that the validity defect of the disputed arbitration agreement could not be fixed through the party's participation of the arbitration proceeding without objections. That is to say the SPC did not recognize the validity uh, uh, of the uh, uh, factual arbitration agreement reached through the party's participation of the arbitration proceeding without objection. The reason is quite simple and, and similar. 
the core principle is that the PRC law, law does not authorize the parties to choose foreign arbitration institutions in the dispute without the foreign related elements. Thus, no, no matter whether it is a, a pre-dispute arbitration agreement or a factual arbitration agreement that reached after dispute arise, the PRC law would not recognize its validity as long as the dispute itself does not contain foreign related elements. So, uh, thank you, Yingling. Yeah, thank you, Helen. So, you, so thank you very much for your uh, detailed the analysis of the SPC because I understand this case, Cao Lai Xinsen case, it was quite important for uh, all the Chinese practitioners. I believe this yes. case is also important for international practitioners if they want to enforce yes. any international arbitral award in uh, mainland court. So I have the question for May. So uh, I, we can take Cao Lai Xinsen as an example. If the claimant, uh, uh, get some uh, refusal from PRC court. If the claimant want to enforce this uh, award, KCAB award, uh, before Hong Kong court or South Korea court, do you think there is any different uh, decision on, on, on the enforcement of the award? Right, um, I'm going to approach this from two angles. One is my experience and one is from theory. So my experience is that I'm not familiar and it'll be interesting from the the audience, whether they are familiar with any cases where an award that has been declared unenforceable in the mainland has subsequently been enforced in Hong Kong. Um, perhaps this issue doesn't come up much because it's been declared unenforceable because it was considered that um, the dispute had no foreign related elements. So I guess that's for that reason, maybe there are just no assets outside of, of the mainland to enforce against. So that's my experience. But having said that, my, I believe that as the award was rendered in a seat of arbitration outside of mainland, and it has not in, in your kind of factual scenario with, with the Tao Lai case, it has not been set aside in the seat of arbitration in Chao Lai Xingxin, that would be Korea, then in theory, it should be enforceable. And there are case, sorry, there are jurisdictions who are so pro-enforcement, uh, France, for example, that even where uh, an award has been set aside in the seat of arbitration, those jurisdictions will still consider enforcing the award. So I think in, in, in your hypothetical, um, where it hasn't been set aside in Korea, then there's definitely in theory, a possibility of seeking enforcement in Hong Kong or in Korea or anywhere else that the respondent has assets. But having said that, if Helen is right, and the better and more accurate reason for non-enforcement is public policy and not invalidity of the arbitration agreement, then even as a matter of internal uh, consistency with PRC law, there's no reason why even under PRC law, it would not allow enforcement outside of China where Chinese public policy doesn't apply. So long as the arbitration agreement is valid under a foreign law and there are you know the practicalities of having assets outside of mainland China you know you can take that box then if Helen is right then you know even even under Chinese law this award should be enforceable outside of mainland China okay so yeah. thank you May and so let's move to the last group of questions so um, uh, just the Helen mentioned the Cao Lai Xinsen case in 2013 and the landmark, golden landmark case in the 2015. Uh, according to my understanding, during the uh, next years, the China has a, a huge development in its policy about the free trade zones. So uh, over the last six years, according to my understanding, the SPC has issued a number of opinions to support the free trade zone, including Hainan Island free trade zone and the Shanghai free trade zone and Beijing. And uh, uh, I can show you a map about China right now. So you can see that half of the Chinese nation, China territory are free trade zone area. So um, um, 
So would you please uh, introduce the new development from the SPC's opinion about the free trade zone and the foreign related elements, the scope of the new development of foreign related elements. And uh, 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 after you introduce those new developments, I have a question for you. The SPC's opinion or the SPC's uh, uh, reply or interpretation are, are the formal authorities of Chinese law. Yeah, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Yang Ling. Uh, you can, can you, yes, thank you. Um, in 2016, SPC issued its opinion on providing judicial service uh, and, the, and the guarantees for a free trade zone. Uh, in this opinion, SPC clarified in the commercial cases, if either party or both parties are wolfies registered in pilot free trade zone, the PRC court shall not announce the arbitration agreement between the parties invalid, simply based on the grounds of lack of foreign related elements. I think this is one of the important points. Uh, we need to uh, refer to this uh, SPC opinion in terms of uh, the PRC arbitration practice. And later on in 2018, uh, in the SPC opinions on providing judicial services uh, and the guarantees for Hainan, the SPC further clarified, PRC court shall not announce the arbitration agreement between the parties of the civil and the commercial case in pilot free trade zone invalid based on the grounds of the lack of foreign related elements. So I, I, I believe this is uh, showing the SPC's uh, support in developing Chinese economy in the free trade zone and promote free trade zone. So, so th these kind of SPC's uh, opinions are the formal authorities and the Chinese yes, law? Yes. Okay, uh, as a PRC practicing lawyer, I would see that those SPC interpretations and opinions are a formal legal authority on the Chinese law in a broader sense. As SPC enjoys the power to interpret the law based on the PRC legislative law, and all lower courts must abide by such SPC opinions. And in terms of foreign elements, as I introduced before, there are five circumstances and uh, uh, clarifying special cases uh, uh, which bears, uh, which bear uh, foreign elements is under the last uh, situation. So I think that, that this PRC opinion, SPC opinion uh, has a bending force. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I have a last two questions for May. So May, so uh, according to the analysis from Helen about the uh, new SPC's opinions to safeguarding the FTZ zones over the several years. So do you see the uh, a trend of, of PRC court have enlarged the scope of the foreign related elements? Uh, and if so, uh, What's your suggestions for international parties or international practice uh, practitioners to dealing with the uh, mainland Chinese contract? Um, yes, I think the trend is definitely towards liberalizing um, and giving users more options um, to choose from when they're arbitrating their China related disputes and contracts. Um, you know, exactly how fast it will move and, uh, you know, what it will mean for what's the next step in terms of the liberalization in, in China. I think, um, uh, you know, I'm going to, going to help you advertise again, Yang Ling. I, I think everyone should come back for the second webinar in the series, which is about foreign arbitral institutions administering arbitrations in mainland China um, in May. Something, I think, as an arbitration practitioner, we would love to see. 
And I'm sure clients and users of arbitration are all supportive of having more options for arbitration for their China related contracts. So, so that's what we are all looking forward to, to the liberalization as well as to the next webinar. Um, on your second question in terms of, uh, of tips, I guess um, I would make three points. The, the first one would be, you know, it's very important because this is a very technical area to get the right advice. Whilst the PRC is definitely becoming more arbitration friendly, its rules, particularly on this issue of foreign related elements, are very unique. And so it's important to get the right advice from someone who understands the nuances. And as Helen mentioned, you know, with different SPC uh, interpretations, the rules can change and the boundaries can be drawn slightly differently. So you do need to check back on latest developments regularly. The second point I'd make is, is uh, one of regional variation. I think there is some small differences in the way that local courts in the mainland will approach an issue. You know, the PRC is a very big place and the level of familiarity with arbitration, particularly international arbitration can vary quite a lot from court to court. So again, I think you need to not just check in with a PRC lawyer, but sometimes check specifically with a regional person who is familiar with the region you want to enforce in. And finally, um, again, I'm probably heading into territory that needs to be another webinar, uh, Yang Ling, is, is don't assume that your onshore domestic arbitration will be the same as your offshore international arbitration. There are many good things about domestic arbitration, you know, CTAC, which a lot of us are very familiar with, is very efficient quick, uh, cost-effective, but there are also many features that are not the same and in fact can be completely different from international arbitration. And, and some of this was touched on in the Q&A, which unfortunately we haven't had a chance to answer all of them. You know, the automatic right to appoint any arbitrator that you want, um, that's not something that's available onshore um, arbitration. Um, the automatic right to adduce expert evidence, for example, is something that, you know, is slowly becoming, um, you know, increasingly popular on onshore arbitration, whereas it's, you know, an automatic right almost in international arbitration. So there are lots of differences. Once you understand the rules on foreign related elements and, and, and therefore choose the right dispute resolution mechanism, you still have to understand how the processes vary between the different options. Um, so those are my top tips. Yeah, thank you. Very useful tips, I believe. Thank you, May. So uh, due to the interest of time, so I have seen uh, many questions on the Q&A board. So maybe Helen, you can choose one of them to answer. And May, you feel free to choose one of them to answer already, okay? So I, I have seen a question okay. very, very interesting that uh, maybe Helen, you can answer this question. So. Uh, uh, I, I, I see from my screen the first question raised by Joseph, Joseph. Maria, yeah. Julia. Yes, yes. You can, you can. can I answer this question? Uh, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in a situ so, situation like the golf course case, uh, Wufi company registered in Beijing, would it make a difference if the contracts with the Chinese counterparty? included the foreign owner of the Wufi as a guarantor of the Wufi's obligation and a joint beneficiary of rights under the contract. Uh, I would say yes, it will make huge difference if you add a foreign party into the contract and uh, give this uh, party certain uh, right and obligation to perform as a guarantor of court. Of course, it has the obligation under this uh, uh, contractual arrangement. So this will make it qualified as a foreign related contract. Okay, thank you, Helen, very clear. So May. Um, do you have a question you want to, to pose? I'm just, I, I'm struggling to, to pick and choose. <laughs> so, so many good questions. So I have yeah, seen exactly. one question is quite, quite, I mean, quite important for Hong Kong. So. The question came from Keisha. Uh, he asked how long Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau would be regarded as a foreign jurisdictions by the mainland PRC? 
Yes, that's a very good question. Yeah. I yeah. think if I, knew, if I knew the answer to that, I think, um, yeah, well, I would be a very, very good lawyer. I, I, I tried to trace the first law or SPC interpretation giving this uh, concept. Uh, but I have been practicing law for 27 years. It was in my mind when I started to practice. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau is deemed as a foreign jurisdiction. For many, many years. Yes. yes. Many, many years. Many, many, many years. Many, many, many years. Yeah. So, May, do you have any comments on that? I mean, it's certainly been, certainly been around since um, the return of, of for Hong Kong, because I'm based in Hong Kong, it's certainly been around since the return of, uh, of Hong Kong to the PRC. And I think the basic law guarantees it for 50 years, um, which expires, what is it, it's um, 2047 maybe. Um, so that would be my guess, I suppose. Okay, May, I have another last question for you from Grace Gong. Uh, Grace asked a question, is Hong Kong IAC deemed as a foreign arbitration institution? May? Yes, for now it is. Yes. <laughs> Although yes, you should that's... be answering that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Hong Kong International Arbitration Center is a foreign arbitration institution under Chinese law. That's correct, yes. yes. So uh, due to the interest of time, I should uh, give a very quick sum up and uh, give a few key uh, takeaways from today's webinar. So uh, uh, the, the concept of foreign related elements has uh, multiple significant legal implications under Chinese law. Firstly, only those contracts that involve foreign related elements could be submitted to offshore arbitration institutions such as Hong Kong IAC for arbitration. And such circumstances, the SPC, the PRC Supreme People's Court will be involved in review process and render its review opinion bending on the lower courts when it comes to Chinese courts review of the validity of arbitration agreements and their decision to enforce or set aside arbitral award. Second, only foreign related matters can provide it for the non-PRC law as the governing laws. Third, although historically the Chinese court have adopted a conservative approach and the interpreted the requirement for foreign related elements narrowly, with the rise of a number of recent leading cases and the judiciary policies in China, which have indeed we made a bold move. The criteria now is a departing from that long-standing tradition and becoming more inclusive and flexible. This in turn reflects the evolving landscape of an increasing open PRC arbitration market. Fourth, when reviewed the validity of the arbitration agreement, the Chinese court tend to treat the rules concerning foreign related elements as some, some mandatory rules, violation of which will lead to invalidity of arbitration agreements or refusal to recognize and enforce arbitral award by Chinese court. By contrast, it remains to seem whether foreign court would review those rules as mandatory rules and accordingly take the same actions as the PRC court do. The lastly, it also remains to be seen to what extent the jurisprudence surrounding the foreign related elements and the Chinese law will affect the calculation of offshore arbitral tribunals in determining the validity of arbitration agreement. So that's all. This concludes our first session of Hong Kong IAC arbitration, Chinese arbitration insight webinar series. Thanks a lot for Helen. Thanks a lot for May. And thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. We look forward to see you in May for our second session on the 23rd or 1st of May. And the second session will be focusing on the seat of arbitration 
just may mention that the, the foreign arbitration institution, uh, the mystering arbitration in mainland China. Okay, thank you all. See you next time. Bye bye. Enjoying the night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Yang Ling. Thank you for HKIC for the invitation. Thank you for the audience. Bye. Likewise. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, May.